Hello again, this is Peter Gade with the USMLE RX Express team. And in this lecture in immunology, we're really going to talk about a variety of things. For the most part, we've gone over the conceptual framework of the immune system, its divisions, and different cell types. But in this lecture, we're really going to hit the details, which can definitely make this section a bit more fact-heavy and a bit more memorization-heavy. But as you'll see, some things are intuitive and do have good explanations that can help you tie the facts together. In this lecture, we'll talk about the complement cascade and how it's used to protect against pathogens. We'll also talk about a number of cytokines, which we've already mentioned before, but we'll reconsider them here, sort of side by side to one another. We'll talk about some cell surface markers, again, some of which we've already discussed. And then we'll move on and talk about the four kinds of hypersensitivity reactions and help you to keep them straight in your mind. We'll then move on to talk about several immunodeficiencies, which are relatively high yields for the exam. Finally, we'll talk about tissue grafts, transplantation, and how the immune system mediates rejection of these tissues. Okay, so the complement cascade. Here it is. Complement proteins are actually glycoproteins, most of which are produced in the liver and secreted into the blood. There's a lot going on this slide, but there's really two main purposes of the complement cascade. The first is microbial lysis, or microbial killing. As you'll see, complement by itself can actually kill microbes. And I'll explain that in a moment. The second is immune cell recruitment. And this happens because as the complement proteins are being activated, they form byproducts which are actually chemotactic to neutrophils and macrophages. Of course, once these two cells, the neutrophil and the macrophage, are recruited to a site of an infection, they can do their own jobs in killing the bacteria or fungus, or whatever it is that's infecting the body. So let's just address that first point right away. Microbial lysis. Well, how does that happen? Well, the first thing to say is that the complement cascade can be activated in one of three ways. The so-called alternative pathway, the lectin pathway, and the classical pathway. I'll explain these in a moment, but the thing to take, the important thing, is that despite the method of activation, the complement cascade can result in the formation of something called the membrane attack complex, or MAC. And this was something that was mentioned before in the immunology lectures. The membrane attack complex is a combination of the complement proteins known as C5, C6, C7, C8, and C9. In terms of nomenclature, actually, the complement proteins are labeled C1 through C9. But anyway, C5 through C9 form the membrane attack complex. And essentially, this forms a pore on the pathogen's membrane. So if it was a bacteria, or if it were a fungus, complement would be deposited on the pathogen cell membrane until finally complement proteins 5 through 9 came together and formed this membrane attack complex, creating a hole in the bacteria and essentially resulting in lysis. Now the specific steps from activation via one of the three mechanisms listed here to the ultimate formation of the membrane attack complex is not as important as understanding the differences between each mechanism of activation. So let's talk about that now. In the so-called alternative pathway, the complement protein C3, which is being constitutively produced by the liver and is constantly floating around in the blood and throughout the tissues, is deposited on a pathogen's membrane. If the pathogen cannot inactivate C3, it will actually trigger this chain reaction, what you see here, leading towards the membrane attack complex. Thus, in a very literal way, the alternative pathway is always quote-unquote on. C3 is always floating around in the blood and through the tissues, and if it becomes deposited on a pathogen and is not removed or inactivated, it's going to go ahead and do its thing. It's going to trigger this reaction. So that's pretty interesting. You might be thinking right now, why does C3 recognize pathogens and not host cells? Well, actually, C3 does recognize host cells. That is, C3 actually binds to normal cells. But normal cells have something that's called decay accelerating factor, or DAF. And what DAF does is simply inactivate C3 and thus avoid destruction. Microbes, on the other hand, do not have DAF. Thus, when C3 is deposited, it becomes activated. You can imagine that if a person were deficient for the decay accelerating factor, there may be some problems. And indeed, there is. People with a deficiency in DAF can be affected by a disease known as proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. For some reason, this tends to occur more often at night, 
and so when a person wakes up in the morning and goes to urinate they may find that their urine actually has a red hue because of all the red blood cell lysis and the hemoglobin that's entering into the urine so again the main thing to remember here is that the alternative pathway is always on and results when c3 is deposited onto a pathogen surface the other thing just to mention briefly is that while the alternative pathway is activated because C3 cannot be deactivated or inhibited, it can also be triggered by certain patterns that are found on pathogens. So it actually appears that both mechanisms are at play, but the absence of DAF seems to be the more important factor here. Next, let's talk about the classic pathway. Classic activation of complement is antibody-mediated. Remember that we talked about this in the antibody lecture. The FC portion of an antibody can activate complement. Remember that this happens when the antibody is actually bound to the pathogen. Once this occurs, the complement protein known as C1 is activated and deposited onto the pathogen. Remember that only certain kinds of antibodies, that is certain isotypes, can do this. Remember that IgA cannot do this because it's formed in a dimer and the FC portion is occupied. Remember that IgG and IgM are the best isotypes at activating complement. And that would make sense because these are the predominant antibodies that are floating around in the blood and through the tissues. In other words, these antibodies are found in the same places where you find complement proteins. Now it should be mentioned that the classical pathway was named as such because it was the first to be discovered. But the alternative pathway is actually the evolutionarily more ancient of the two systems. And we know this because animals which do not have an adaptive system, that is they don't have T cells and B cells, do have complement. So it's thought to have evolved long ago. Finally, the lectin pathway is perhaps the least important, or at least the pathway that's least understood. Like the alternative pathway, the lectin pathway is quite old, and it is activated when mannin binding lectin, or MBL, recognizes mannin residues found on the surfaces of some microbes. Once MBL is activated, it converges along roughly the same path as the classical pathway. Again, and as usual, leading to the formation of the membrane attack complex. So what's one way that we can group all these pathways? There are three of them. But realize that the lectin pathway and the alternative pathway are not dependent on the adaptive system. The classical pathway, on the other hand, depends on antibody. Antibody is what is activating the complement proteins in this case. And this is a major distinction that you should keep in mind. And that's really it. That is the complement cascade in a nutshell. And those are really important points. I'll just point out a few other high yield facts. Now, in addition to lysing microbes and recruiting immune cells, namely neutrophils and macrophages, the complement cascade produces a molecule which is known as C3B. And like many of the complement proteins, C3B will coat a pathogen surface. Here I'm just drawing them as little balls. This is uh, clearly not to scale. Uh, none of my drawings have really have been to scale, I should, I should say that. Now the thing to realize is that many phagocytes, especially macrophages, have receptors for C3B. Here's my macrophage. Isn't he terrifying? Again, not drawn to scale. But anyway, when macrophages bind to C3B on the surface of pathogens, they become extremely good at phagocytosing these pathogens. Basically, it gives macrophages another way to recognize, hold on to, and eventually engulf the pathogen. And this process, we've talked about it before, is known as opsonization. Remember that antibodies also have opsonizing properties, and that's because when an antibody coats a pathogen, a macrophage can come along and recognize the FC portion of the antibody with a receptor that's known as the FC receptor. Not very creative. Again, this improves the macrophage's recognition of the pathogen and allows it to better phagocytose and destroy the pathogen. So this process of decorating a pathogen with some kind of molecule that can be recognized by a phagocyte, such as a macrophage or a neutrophil, is known as opsonization. But isn't it kind of incredible that even though the antibody is an opsonin itself, it's also enhancing the deposition of complement proteins onto the pathogen, which are themselves opsonins. 
So it's almost like a double hit. The antibody is both an opsonin and enhances the deposition of other opsonins onto the pathogen. Okay, so that was C3B. Let's also talk about C3A and C5A. Again, C3A and C5A are other products of the complement cascade. And even though this figure down here is kind of small, take a look in your book and you'll be able to find them. Here's C3A, C3A is also here, here's C5A. But in any case, C3A and C5A will be produced at the site of an infection when the complement cascade is activated. And what they do is actually cause two main things to happen. The first is that they'll make the blood vessels leaky in the vicinity of the infection. And these leaky blood vessels, of course, allow immune cells like neutrophils to enter into the tissue. Once a neutrophil has entered the tissue, these products serve as chemoattractants for neutrophils. The neutrophils actually begin to crawl towards the source of C3A and C5A. They begin moving where C3A and C5A are the most concentrated. And this process, of course, is known as neutrophil chemotaxis. Chemo standing for chemical, taxis standing for movement. So you can see how the complement cascade is working to recruit immune cells to the site of an infection and enhance the phagocytosis and destruction of those pathogens. Okay, moving on. And actually, I'm just going to go ahead and clean this up a little bit. So take your notes now. We already discussed the membrane attack complex, so I'm not going to go over that again. Before we move on here, we'll just note that deficiencies in certain complement proteins, like C3 or C5 through 8, can lead to certain infectious susceptibilities. For example, deficiency of C5 through C8 predisposes someone to Neisseria infections, whereas deficiency of C3 can result in recurrent pyogenic sinus and respiratory tract infections. Finally, we'll note that there exists a protein known as C1 esterase inhibitor, which actually inhibits the activated form of C1. In a way, it's a type of regulation of the internal system. People with a deficiency in C1 esterase inhibitor and thus have C1 esterase overactivity, meaning that they're activating C1 much more than is appropriate, can suffer from a disease known as hereditary angioedema. Most impressively, this disease can result in extreme and life-threatening swelling in the larynx and face and other parts of the airway, which can result in death. And why might this be happening? Well, we just talked about the role that C3A and C5A have in an immune response. Remember that I said they did two things. They make vessels leaky, and they recruit immune cells like neutrophils into the tissue. So when there's a deficiency of C1 esterase inhibitor, this complement cascade is being activated inappropriately, and too much C3A and C5A is being generated. And it's being generated throughout the airways. So you have this massive immune response, this massive influx of fluid, immune cells, everything sort of flooding out from the blood into the tissues which can make it very hard to breathe, as you'd imagine. So that was quite a bit, but hopefully the complement cascade makes much more sense now. In summary, remember that the two goals of the complement cascade are to cause microbial lysis and to recruit immune cells like neutrophils in macrophages to sites of infection. Once these immune cells are there, they can do their thing and begin phagocytosing pathogens. And this phagocytosis is enhanced by complement proteins themselves, in particular C3B. Finally, we know that complement can be activated in three ways. The alternative pathway, which is quote-unquote always on, the lectin pathway, and the classical pathway, which is dependent on the presence of antibodies.